Oh, hi. I was just looking at this record. Lady Gaga. Uh, hey, everybody. Lecture number two. The lecture on... <coughs> lecture. Um, there's so much. I thought we'd end with something where we started. Sociologists love religion. Uh, remember Max Weber, the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. Durkheim talking about religion and anomie. I mean, we just... Marx had a few things to say about religion. So this is, um, man, I have a lot of coffee. Uh, this is uh, a sort of a quick version. It's going to take on one question, which is why is religion a cultural universal? We're going to talk about the definition. I'll just have a little outline here. The definition of religion. Uh, and then talk about religion as a cultural universal using our three paradigms. Let's end up where we began by talking about paradigms. Why not for old time's sake? Okay, so the first thing is about how we define religion. What is religion? Worship of, I mean, there's all kinds of religions in the world, right? There are pan, pantheistic religions and monotheistic religions and religions that see uh, God as the source of all things. Religion that see God as a manifestation of the source, like Hinduism. I mean, there's just so many different types of religion. So uh, so the, the best definition that we like to use is from our friend Durkheim. Remember Durkheim, you know, was, came from a long line of rabbis. Uh, and so he was very interested in religion. And he gave us a sort of really good definition of religion. So here we go. Definition of religion. Multiple choice question, sounds like to me. Religion is a belief system, right? Because you believe this thing is true. Is a belief system that looks at the relationship between the sacred and the profane. What do we mean by that? The sacred and the profane. The pr profane, it doesn't mean profane dirty. Don't be profane. Profane just means the physical world that we live in. The world that we can see is the profane world. Because, you know, he's writing in 1890. So, um, And then the sacred is the world that we can't see, the spiritual world, the world that's beyond our comprehension, the world that exists after we die, the world that was here before we were here. You know, all of that stuff is to the spiritual world. So a, a belief system that looks at the link between the sacred and the profane and connects them through ritual. So belief system, sacred and profane, and the third part is it connects them through ritual. So some type of religious ritual. It could be praying five times a day facing Mecca. It could be say, saying the rosary, Hail Mary, our Father, all those things, our Father who art in heaven, herald be thy name, as we would say in religious school. Uh, you know, these various religious rituals, Sunday Mass, lighting the menorah, Midnight Mass, you know, all these things. Uh, and so religion does that. So whether we're talking about a massive religion like Catholicism or we're talking about a newer religion like Scientology, uh, they all work to connect the spiritual world and the physical world through the use of ritual. That's it. That's your definition. Okay, so using that, which can explain, you know, a dominant religion like Islam or a tiny religion like worshipping a turnip. I don't know. I don't know what the smallest religion in the world is. I worship coffee. Um, uh, we want to ask this question, why is religion a cultural universal? So what is a cultural universal? We've talked about this a little bit. A cultural universal is something that you find in nearly every culture, if not every culture. So, for example, the family is a cultural universal. It's our primary socialization agent. And you might have a family that's very small, mom, dad, and 1.3 kids. Uh, you might have a family that's huge, that has all your uncles and aunts and grandmas and grand uh, everybody living together. Uh, it might be a blended family, like the Brady Bunch. It might be an adoptive family. But, you know, there's some version of the family in every culture of the world. Marriage. Uh, some version of marriage, right? You have to sort of connect families. Marriage is a cultural universal. We find it all over the world. Patriarchy is not a cultural universal. As we've discussed, patriarchy is only in about 80% of the cultures on earth. The rest are partnership societies, Eisler. Uh, but religion is, whether they're worshiping God the Father or SpongeBob SquarePants, whatever, you know, whatever it is, there is some version of religion around the world. Even, you know, the notion of atheism as a rejection of religion can be a religion in of itself. So the question is, why? Why is religion such a big thing? There's a, of course, we're sociologists, so we're not going to say God makes it that way. 
because there are a lot of different gods and goddesses, multiple gods. I mean, there are all kinds of contradictory gods. So which god do you pray to? Depends on your religion because they're all a little bit different. Blue gods. I like the Hindu blue gods. They're my favorite color gods. Um, so I thought we'd answer this question, or at least we'd, we'd sort of, we never answer questions, but we pursue these questions as academics by going back to our three paradigms. So we go back to our three paradigms to talk about this. So let's, let's do this, shall we? One more time into the void of paradigms. Okay, so let's start with a functionalist. The functionalist paradigm. The functionalist paradigm, remember, the functionalist paradigm sees um, the cell, right? And so the cell is going to have parts in it that are there because they function the nucleus. So that might be the family. But religion also is there because it's functional. It's the endoplasmic reticulum, I guess. The uh, And so religion performs a function. What is that function? Well, Durkheim, being the classic functionalist, studied this, and he wrote a lot about what is the function of religion. And what he found was that the function of religion, why people become members of whatever religion is in their neighborhood, is because it is social. It's a social thing. That what, growing up in the Bible Belt, on Sunday, everybody goes to church. Like, you would be crazy not to go to church, because you go there not because you want to get right with God and make your way into heaven, but you want to see all your friends, and you want to see who's where and what, and who's dating whom, and a lot of people hook up at church. I mean, not in the church, but, you know, they meet at church, and then they get married in a very sanctimonious way and lose their virginity on their wedding night. Uh, that, you know, that it's very functional. So he talked about sort of three functions associated with religion. The first is cohesion, that it brings people together, gives people a kind of place to be grounded, a sense of belonging, and, um, and this sort of, you know, way of sharing uh, what is sacred, this, this guy of uh, the way of, um, you know, kind of having a, a, an orientation. You know, we all dress the same. We all sort of think the same way. We all cut our hair the same way. You know, if you were talking about the Amish or you are talking about Hasidic Jews, you know, we have this sort of sense of uh, commonality that brings us together. So there's a social cohesion element. The second related to that is control. It helps pe get people to follow the rules and have a functioning organism. Everybody's got to follow the rules. What happens if you don't follow the rules? You burn in hell. There's some type of punishment for you out there. And it could be the punishment, you know, the priest is going to kick you out or the shaman is going to kick you out of the tribe, whatever it is. There's some type of social control to get everybody to follow the rules. Because, again, the mandate from the functionalist perspective is we need everybody to follow the rules so it works. And the third part is it gives people a, a, a sense of understanding of how the world works. Things are very confusing out there in the world. Why do good things happen to bad people? Why do bad things happen to good people? Uh, I'm not going to talk about Donald Trump. Do you think he has the coronavirus? There's a much, be much discussion is going on about that. Does our president have the virus? Um, anyway, the uh, you know why do these things happen? It helps people sort of make sense of the world so they can get on with the business of having children and building houses and making a functioning society because it helps them understand some of the things that don't. So we're going to come back to that theme in a minute. So cohesion, social control, and give meaning. Uh, so therefore, religion is a cultural universal because it's functional. But, and each one of these three paradigms has a good but, but we can look at the world and say, yeah, but religion is pretty dysfunctional also. Look at Ireland. <laughs> Ireland, 600 years of conflict between the Catholics and the Protestants. Let's look at what's happening in you know, Syria and Iraq between Shiites and Sunni Muslims. I mean, what's happening in India right now? India is turning upside down in violence by Hindus against Muslims. How functional is that shit? Like, it is ugly, ugly, ugly what's happening in India and much of the world right now because of religion. It is very dysfunctional. But if you remember, functionalists would always say, take the dysfunctions and take the functions. And if it's more functional than dysfunctional, it's going to stay. Right, we're gonna keep the religion because it's still. But I would argue, now that we have social media, think about the function of religion. Think about what Durkheim said about religion being functional because it creates a sense of community, social cohesion. Where you go on Sunday mornings at eleven a.m., you go to church. Who goes to church anymore on Sundays at eleven? Right, everybody is like working or hanging out with their friends, and where are they finding that community? Right, they're finding it online in their social media 
contacts and their kind of online world. So religion might be a little less functional than it was when Durkheim was writing about this over a hundred years ago. So just something to think about, but the idea that religion is functional because it's it creates sort of a, a, a social organism that works. Okay, that's our functionalist perspective. Symbolic interactionist. All right, well, we've already really talked about this when we talked about the social construction of God. How do we get to the notion of God as a male, especially a white male that's 65 years old? Like that is all a social construction of a reality process, that we construct the sacred. Who writes the books <laughs> that people think of as sacred? Who writes, you know, the Torah and the Bhagavad Gita and the, you know, gospel according to John and the, you know, the book of Mormon and, you know, all these sacred books. I'm going to, they were all written by people. They were written by people. But we put our faith in these books that were written and rewritten and translated by people. Um, they weren't, it wasn't like God's fingers came down on a laptop and wrote the New Testament. <laughs> Uh, this stuff is all written by people, and it was socially constructed by people. So the stuff that you read in Eisler about the Gnostic Gospels, a great example of the social construction of faith, that we create these things. But why? Why is it so important to do this? Well, so if you remember the social construction of reality, the names there were Berger and Luckman. They were the guys that wrote the book in the 1960s that blew everybody's brain called The Social Construction of Reality. Well, Peter Berger wrote an amazing book after that called The Sacred Canopy. It's one of the best books about the sociology of religion. It's also somewhere, not here in the vinyl room, but um, somewhere. Uh, great book about religion. And he, um, he sort of goes into this thing about why do we need this? We, you know, our faith ultimately is in people, even in prophets. Like with prophets are people who supposedly are talking to God and translating God's will for the rest of us. And we follow them. We're not following God. We're following them because we trust them. If somebody were to do that now, you might think that they were kind of cuckoo. I used to do this thing when I taught this section of my uh, intro class at Portland State where I'd have like this vision. I'm like, don't, 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 don't you see? God is right there and hanging in the sky. Don't you see her? She's right there. Well, am I the only one that sees her? And people are like, what the hell is going on with plays? Like, well, she's, she's giving me the new commandments. And I would, you know, go to the chalkboard and I'd write, study for your final exam. Commandment number two, one. Commandment number two, uh, watch The Bachelor Sunday nights on ABC. You know, like these are, and how do you know that I'm not a prophet? How do you know? Because you know that I'm, you know, messing with you. But that, I mean, who's to say all the other prophets, peace be upon them, are not also messing with you. But we put all our faith in these people. And so Berger wanted to ask, why do we do this? And I'll tell you why, and it makes a lot of sense. It's what he called a coping me mechanism. Religion is a cultural universal because it is a coping mechanism because there is stuff that we can't handle not knowing. What happens to you when you die? What happens? You know, there are these stories of people who die on the operating table and then they come back to life and they're like, I was dead and I went through a tunnel towards the light. And like, first of all, you were never dead. You were never, the heart stopped, but your brain was still going. And I would say that that tunnel towards the light, your mother's vagina, you know, you're having a birth memory or something. You weren't dead. Nobody's ever been dead and come back to tell you. Some people will will pretend that they have and they'll make a lot of money because they'll sell it to people who want to desperately know what happens when you die. None of us knows. None of us knows. You will either find out or you won't because the lights will just shut down and it's over. I had a student, we were talking about this in a class and, you know, because I'm, I'm a militant agnostic. I'm happy not knowing. I'm perfectly okay not knowing what's it, what it's all about, Alfie. And so a student said, now, Mr. Randy, you don't believe in life after death? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. And I had another student say, what do you remember from before you were born? And this first student said, N nothing. And then the other student said, that's what it's like when you die. Nothing. And of course, they don't know either. They, none of us know. But we can't handle the idea that we won't exist. We can't handle the idea that when we die, we don't go somewhere else. Or the people that we love are somewhere out there watching us. That when our grandmas die, they go to a better place and they're just there waiting for us to come join them. And the, I mean, it's romantic and I can totally get why people see this. I mean, I always feel bad for dead Jimi Hendrix because dead Jimi Hendrix must be like, 
leave me alone. Because everybody's like, well, when I died, I just went to the jam with Hendrix. And Hendrix is like, I must be in hell. Um, and it's just, it's a beautiful romantic notion to help us understand why are we here? Where did we come from? What is the notion of infinity? Like our brains just can't handle the notion of infinity. We just don't go that far in our consciousness. So it must be God. And, you know, we have over, and, and, and Berger talks about this, the things that science has started to explain used to be things that God explained. You know, if there is an eclipse, it used to be the wolf god is eating the sun god. And now we know what an eclipse is, right? It's the shadow uh, of the earth on the moon. Right. We now have a, a, a way of making sense of what that is because of science and science is explaining more and more of what God used to explain, which people couldn't explain. What are the stars? Where are they? Well, they're a bunch of suns and they're all out there in different galaxies. Get over it. So there is this coping mechanism that religion allows us. But I say that I say that as like a militant agnostic, like it's all bullshit. Um, but I know if my child was sick. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is pray my ass off, right? If, my, if, my, if Cozy is in the hospital tomorrow, I'm down on my knees like, please, God, I don't know if you're there. Please help. I haven't been very good. And I often swear in front of my students, but please, God, please help her, right? There is, you know, it's a very powerful social construction. But so each one of them has sort of another side. The argument about what the other side of the social construction of religion as a coping mechanism is, is that we know this. We know that it's all BS. We know that people wrote the Bible. We know that we don't know that what happens when we die or where we came from. We have to sort of admit or pretend to not know it. We have to put on this act. It's sort of like the Wizard of Oz. Have you ever seen the w Wizard of Oz when the head of Oz is this big burning head and then Toto pulls down the curtain and you see the Wizard of Oz is really this little old man who's pulling the levers? We know that in reality, there's a guy pulling the levers to creating this big illusion, but we have to agree not to look behind the curtain, behind the sacred canopy. That's the name of the book. We have to sort of pretend that the construction is actually very real and the sacred is real and God, as we've been told, is real. And we have to just sort of go along with it because then if we get rid of that, if we look behind the curtain, then what? Then what happens when we die? It sucks. We don't know. <laughs> so that's number two. Symbolic interaction is... Religion is a cultural universal because it's a coping mechanism to help us get through the rough times and through the times where we don't understand what happens. We want to think that we live forever. I'm not going to say, but that we you know, live forever. We can't imagine not existing. Lights go out. That's it. Okay, the third one. I'm saying the best to last. The conflict perspective. The conflict perspective is really the easiest because the conflict perspective is all about power. Conflict perspective is about the um, the power dynamic, the haves and the have-nots, about exploitation and maintaining the status quo. So the answer here is super simple. Religion is a cultural universal because it creates power dynamics and avenues of oppression. So we've talked about this. Karl Marx, who said, famous conflict theorist, right? Religion is the opiate of the masses. That we'll give religion to people so they'll slave away in these factories because they think they're going to be rewarded when they die. And so instead of challenging their boss and having a revolution, they just keep working away, working away, working away because the reward is when we're, de when we're dead. That's great for the, for the capitalists, right? Just work them right to their death. And so there's an example of a power dynamic that's created. Um, the racial power dynamic Religion was used to justify the slaves. The Ku Klux Klan was a Christian organization. They saw God as a white man and black people as not human. They used religion to support the, the status quo. Uh, we'll come back to that one in a second. And of course, the big one that we've been talking about all quarter is gender. The notion of God as male, right, empowers men to be godlike over women who are the original sinners. And we could go on and on and on, but you've been reading about it all quarter about how religion has been used to take away women's power, including the birth power that we saw in the documentary. So from here, the, the, um, the answer to the question is, why is religion a cultural universal? It's because it reinforces power dynamics. It's used as a tool of oppression. Uh, that it is an, religion is an equal opportunity oppressor. I heard someone say once, I think it was probably on a bumper sticker. Religion is an equal opportunity oppressor. It's used to keep people down. But, but, so each one of these has another side. Remember I told you? But the other side of this one is, yeah, really? The, yeah, the Ku Klux Klan was a Christian organization. You know who else was a Christian? Martin Luther King Jr. 
You know, what was he? He was a, he's a doctor, doctor of divinity. He was a preacher in Atlanta uh, and Ebenezer Baptist Church on Auburn Avenue. Been there many times. Uh, he was reading from the same freaking book that the Ku Klux Klan was. One was reading it to justify racism uh, and Martin Luther King was reading it to justify the liberation from racism. How could they from the same book? So there's all this other side that says religion can actually be used to challenge the status quo. If you look at the Jesuit priests who really went against the Catholic Church, I mean, when the Catholics were the conquistadors of Latin America and Mesoamerica and were raping and pillaging the indigenous people of Latin America, it wasn't pretty. I mean, the whole notion of the missionary position and sex comes from missionaries raping indigenous people. That's the way the missionaries would have sex is the man had to be on top instead of behind, which is instead of which is the more common around the world type of intercourse, the missionaries being patriarchal had to be on top of the women. And when they were raping them, that's where the missionary position comes from, right? That is religion as an oppressor. But the Jesuits were like, you need to read that New Testament. That guy Jesus was kind of radical. He, you know, all the things we're talking about, Mary Magdalene and all that good stuff. Uh, there's some radical themes in there, including some feminist themes. And so a really good example of this is when you go to Latin America, especially Mexico, when you go to Mexico, a very Catholic country, you see a lot of images of the Virgin Mary. In fact, you see, I would argue you see more images of Mer Mary, especially as the Virgin of Guadalupe, uh, than you do um, Jesus. You see a lot of that. You also see a lot of saints, all kinds of saint, 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 um, Christopher is my favorite saint whenever I'm late. Hang on, St. Christopher. Uh, which are, are are from the days of the pagan indigenous religions of the Aztecs and the Mayans, when there were goddesses. In fact, when the conquistadors came and tried to shove Christianity down the throat of the indigenous people, they would say, where's your goddess? Well, how come you don't have a goddess? And they say, well, we don't have a goddess, but we have Mary, the mother of God. So take that. Um, and so what you get in Mexico is a lot more images of the Virgin, especially the Virgin of Guadalupe, as a reflection of the goddess origin of the the, patri the partnership origin of Mexican theology before the Catholicism came and sort of supplanted this patriarchy on top of it. And so there are other incredible images of the Virgin as liberating as bringing people together. And so there's this, I'm going to include this link, and I really want you to watch it. There's this wonderful documentary called H.O. in Mexico, Made in Mexico. It's all about the music and culture of Mexico. It's a brilliant documentary. But there's a section of it called Nana Guadalupe. And it's about the shroud uh, that Juan Diego, this guy kind of went up into the hills in Mexico City, and, and the Virgin appeared to him and blazoned her image on his shroud. And you can visit that shroud in the Basil Basilica of Mexico City. I've been there. My daughter has been there, and it's the most amazing thing. Because not only do you get to see this religious icon, there are people crawling on their knees from all across Mexico uh, to visit the shroud. Men crawling on their knees with, you know, just incredible pain and bleeding. You'll see, uh, if you're on a highway in Mexico, you'll see people on bicycle with statues of the Virgin wrapped in thorns or in cactuses so they could suffer the way that Jesus suffered to go and see this apparition of the shroud of the Virgin of Guadalupe. Uh, it's just incredibly powerful and it's really about the feminizing roots behind the patriarchal Catholic Catholic religion. Um, and so an amazing documentary, H.O. Mexico, but I'm including a YouTube clip so you can sort of see this section. It's very emotional and I would encourage anybody that goes to Mexico City to spend some time because it's pretty it's a pretty powerful thing. But if you look at what's happening in Mexico right now, there's an incredible wave of violence against women. Ten women a day are killed in what's called femicide of gender motivated violence against women. And the argument is, from a feminist perspective, that it's an attempt to reestablish the patriarchal nature of the machismo Mexican culture against the feminizing, uh, more gender neutral uh, power of the goddess in our culture. Okay, so those are our three paradigms. Uh, functionalist, religion is functional as a social cohesion, symbolic interactionist, we can socially construct religion as a coping mechanism, and conflict perspective, that religion is um, a power trip. Uh, but there is this thing, this thing called liberation theology, and look at it in your textbook, liberation theology, that uses religion. As someone who's you know tends to be a conflict person, 
I think religion can be pretty oppressive, but there is this beauty in religion that struggles against oppression. There are Muslim feminists. There are very Christian uh, civil rights workers that are working against racism. I mean, religion can be used as a way of liberating people. So liberation theology, take a look at that. So then the last question is, how does this tie in with Eisler? Megan? Uh, you know, which paradigm best fits Eisler? I mean, I think you can find a little bit of all of that. But I want, one of the things I, would, I want you to think, and I'm just going to leave this as a thought question, is we think about the evolution of the goddess and then it becoming this cultural transformation to patriarchy for thousands of years and then the, the, the breakthrough in evolution where we might be moving back to something that looks like a partnership society. Well, how would Eisler answer this question? What, how, why is religion a cultural universal? That might be a really good question. That might be a really good question. Remind me to put that on the final. Okay. Well, I've uh, taken up plenty of her time on a Friday morning. Hopefully, you've been able to watch this. Hopefully, I got it uploaded it and oh, I didn't have to just totally throw away this whole time. Um, there'll be news coming about the final exam. Watch your emails. Um, cool. I hope this worked. If spring starts this way, I might be doing a lot of videos up here. So right on. Uh, I'm sorry we couldn't be there for our final lecture, but um, this has been all right. All right. Peace. Over and out.